Numerous creation myths speak of sound as a formative force in the creation of the universe, the world, or life. In the Bible, in the Bible we have the word, and in Hinduism we have Aum, uh, A-U-M underscore, the four part, part section of Aum, as opposed to just the O-M. Um, Joseph Campbell gives a beautiful breakdown of the actual meanings of Aum, which I feel expresses itself ubiquitously, uh, you know, throughout all of life. Could you share your thoughts on the concept of sound as the creative force of the universe and how you feel source or Aum uh, creates life in general? Paul, great question. And I trust I have an answer befitting the magnitude of the question. <laughs> I think you will. <laughs> but what you shared is true. I could spend the next half hour talking about the creation myths from different traditions and how, how they all encompass some aspect of sound being the initial causative force of life, the universe, and everything. As you said, in the beginning was the word, and the Lord said, let there be light. Sound preceding light. Hindu tradition, in the beginning was Brahman, with whom was the vibration, the vibration was Brahman. In Papal Vu, in the Mayan tradition, you have the first real men and women giving, being given life solely through the power of the word. In the Hopi tradition, the spider woman sings the song of creation and gives life to all inanimate beings. In the um, ancient Egyptian tradition, the god Thoth would think of an object, speak its name, and bring it into being. In the Far East, the gods and goddesses would hit a gong or blow a conch and bring inanimate matter into life. And what I love about this is, okay, so we have our ancient mystics in agreement about this, but now we have our modern quantum physicists talking about this. They talk about super string theory, for example, and how there are just so many different uh, levels and the vibrations of the string are acting uh, slightly out of tune. And what is so interesting about a string, and we'll talk about this later too, but a string displays harmonic principles, which may be the basis of much that is. So we have this totally... Um, unique aspect of uh, life, the universe, and everything coming from sound. I do a monthly, something called a sound satsang that is free, that is live, that people come to. And the last couple of ones that we've done have been on the, you know, power of the mantra. And mm. uh, one of the first things is, you know, talking about Om and just even talking about the pronunciation of Om, because you can have literally when I was first beginning this phenomena back in the early 80s, I read a brilliant book by a guy named a professor named John Blofeld, who uh, the book was called Mantra, and he had a chapter on the pronunciation of Om. And according to him, and it just felt so resonant, so correct, depending upon the dialect, and the people, Om, could be pronounced a whole lot of ways. Now, you will find spiritual masters and gurus who say it must be pronounced Aum. Others will say it's Om or whatnot. You can, you can have so many different ways of doing it. And you're totally technically correct, uh, correct that it's actually a three-syllable word in Sanskrit. But, you know, I have a very dear friend who is a Tibetan monk very high up Tibetan monk, uh, one of the Dalai Lama's favorite chanting monks. And uh, we've talked about this uh, because uh, one of my favorite mantras is the Tibetan mantra, Om Mani Padme Hom, which is mm -hmm. great. But in Tibetan, it's Om Mani Peme Hom, quite mm -hmm. different. And yeah. so we're saying, okay, you know, Lama Tashi, uh, is it does it really matter if we pronounce it one way or the other? And no, his big thing was that ultimately it's the intentionality. Uh, mm -hmm. They have a different term in, in the uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhist tradition, but basically the thoughts, the feelings, the consciousness that is encoded 
upon the sound that really gives it its juice. Yeah, having studied Joseph Campbell's works quite extensively, he speaks at length about Ohm in various books and uh, recordings that I've studied, and he breaks Ohm down. He says, the A, ah, I awaken. Yes. I'm dreaming. Mm -hmm. I'm falling asleep, underscore, end of cycle, beginning of something new. And in his teachings, he says that the pronunciation is ah, uh, and then ooh, and then he says you're supposed to eat the M mm, and take it down into you. Now, of course, he's using the lineage that he studied, I think, which was Hinduism, to, to give us that meaning. But I just find it interesting, particularly, I, I understand what you're saying about pronunciation because I've heard it pr pronounced a million ways. Yes. But what I think's most interesting about Om that a lot of people don't understand is that the Om is actually a creative cycle, and it correlates to the four seasons: spring, I awaken, or birth; ooh, summer, I'm dreaming, I'm living my life, I'm going through the process of experiencing all of it; mm, fall, fruiting phase, I'm now at the later stages of my life and I can look back on it all and see how all the golden threads connect and how it's all so beautiful and meaningful. And then death is the underscore end of cycle. So I think it's amazing that most people don't know the depth of the meaning of, of that word, but when you understand it as a creative principle, not only of sound and a creative force, but also something that is showing us the life cycle that all living beings go through, like the process of morphogenesis, it's really quite a powerful statement. I love Joe Campbell. And yeah. The Power of Myth, one of my favorites. And uh, I would know better than to refute anything that's said. Instead, I would like to suggest that, as you said, that is coming from one aspect of one of the traditions in the Hindu tradition. Yeah. You can, if you like, go talk to many different gurus. I did this when I was doing the uh, sound satsang and mantra, and I went to do what is the correct pronunciation of Om. And in four or five different videos that I watched, they were all different, and they all refuted it is not om. It's not aum. It's not, you know, and I'm going okay. Yeah. Uh, and I, <laughs> but the thing is, if you believe it, yeah, then it is, and that's the important thing. Yeah. We have to really honor ourselves. And I'm gonna just jump in. I don't even know if Joe Campbell or Joseph Campbell. Let us honor him with his full name. Uh, was aware that there's something called Pantanjali's Yoga Sutras. You may yes, have he was aware. He, he speaks about it at length. Right. Well, in one of the major translations, and it's been translated by a gazillion gurus, one, yeah. of, one of my favorite gurus was Swami Satchidananda, who was the Woodstock guru. I was at Woodstock, so this guy hooked me in, and he had a half a million or more people chanting at the same time, and this changed my consciousness. But uh, my wife and I were teaching at his ashram, and I walked into the apartment they had for us, and there was a copy of his translation of the Yoga Sutras. I opened it up, and just synchronistically, if you like, I looked down, there's Sutra 1.27. And this is Goldman's, basically, uh, synthesis of uh, what was written. The original sound of creation was pranava, the humming of prana. They had to give it a name, so they called it Om. Ah. So that's just another event that Om, the hum, was actually the original creative sound. And everything is interrelated, so you can't separate O from M, mm, and you can't separate right. O. Oh, yeah. mm. And in fact, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, but there are a lot of physiological benefits when you hum. And a lot of the yeah. peer-reviewed research that occurred from that was they didn't have people hum, they had people go, om. So most of the time, it also applies to the om. Mm. But I'm digressing. Let's get back to one of your questions. No, I love it. I, I, I want you to feel free to 
share whatever comes to your mind. I mean, I write, I like this to be more dialogue than, than interview. So there is that natural flow. And I think all these things are very important because really the, the, the most important thing that you're pointing to isn't if the, if there's a specific, shall we say formal pronunciation, it's the intention that you're tying to the vibration because ultimately that is the vehicle by which consciousness creates is intention. I, for example, when I'm teaching classes at my institute, I point out the, the, a very important thing that a lot of people don't understand, and that is that the word intention, if God is unconditional love or pure potential, then it is not until you have an intention that you put pure potential in tension. So the analogy I give is if you want to pull somebody out of the ditch with your car, you have to put the rope in tension before you can pull them out. <laughs> So if God is pure potential, then you your intention takes potential and spiritualizes it, and that is the flow of spirit. So if our intention is not clear, then neither will the reaction to the creation that we're making be clear.